Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. Today, we continue our discussion with Larry Swedro about investment mistakes even smart people make. We're moving into the second part of this particular book that you've written, which you've written so many, Larry, it's incredible. This part is called Part Two, Ignorance is Bliss. And we've got two mistakes that we're going to be talking about. Mistake 16 of your long list is, do you fail to see the poison inside the shiny apple? And mistake number 17, do you confuse information with knowledge? Larry, take it away. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I learned uh, long ago, somebody really smart taught me, is if you tell uh, somebody a fact, they learn. If you tell them a truth, they'll believe. But if you tell them a story, it lives in their heart forever. So I try to use lots of stories, analogies to things people are familiar with. And then you can understand the simple concept that you're trying to get across. And then you can understand, hopefully then, how it might apply to a more complex subject like investing. So I was trying to explain the problem with a lot of complex investments um, that are often sold to people or how brokerage firms uh, take advantage of investors. So I thought of the story of Snow White and the Wicked Witch with the Poison Apple. Uh, and the evil queen arrives at Snow White's cottage disguised as an old peddler. And despite being warned by the seven dwarfs to not open the door for anyone and don't accept any gifts, Snow White answers the door and in her naivete, uh, the evil queen lures Snow White into biting the apple, which of course was poison. And she falls into a sleeping death that can only be wait, awakened by love's first kiss. Now, fortunately, the story ends well. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to investing, there's lots of poisoned apples that are really hiding or poisoned hiding inside those shiny apples when it comes to investment products. So in the book, we described how brokers, in effect, you know, enhance their wallets at the expense <laughs> of the consumer's wallets in simple ways by disguising or hiding the fees that they take. Unfortunately, in the United States anyway, the laws have given broker dealers great leeway in allowing fees to be charged that are not considered excessive. So, for example, if you were buying a bond uh, that was trading at par, say interest rates were 5% for double A bonds, and you're buying a double A bond of a certain maturity and that yield should be 5%, so you should buy it at par, that broker dealer could actually sell it to you at 106, charging you six points for doing nothing more than executing an order. Right. There's no risk taking by the firm uh, that is buying the bond and hopefully they could sell it later. They're just going to the market, buying that bond and marking it up. And the courts, amazing to me, have found that six percent is not egregious or whatever. A one percent fee maybe would be acceptable covering the costs and infrastructure and advice. So maybe 1% might be reasonable, uh, but 6% is kind of crazy. So how do brokers take advantage of the naivete of the average investor, especially when lots of bonds don't have public pricing or at least didn't used to? Today, there is more visibility today. Uh, so let's say, Andrew, you want to buy a one-year bond Okay. Yep. Uh, and the yield on that one year bond should be 3%. If I want to charge you a 1% fee, I've got to sell that bond to you at 101. And you're going to look at a screen and say, oh my goodness, I just lost 1%. I'm not getting 3%. I'm getting 2% on that bond because I paid 101. 
and I'm getting only 3% interest. So what does the broker dealer do? Instead of selling you a one-year bond, he sells you a 30-year bond. And now because the 1% cost is spread over 30 years, that cost might be seven basis points. So it sells it to you at 1.007 <laughs> or 0007. <laughs> and you that gets in. He could add five points in there, and you'd only be adding 30, you know, three-fifths of a, a percent to the total cost of the bond. So the average consumer ends up buying much longer-term bonds than they probably should be, but that allows the broker to disguise the fee because it gets spread out over a much longer period. And that that spreading out is a theoretical spreading out because they're actually taking that fee right up front. Yeah. And so right. you're deprived of that money to compound over time. So it's just, that's, that is a brutal tactic. Yeah. So uh, a second strategy is that you sell them a, a, a bond that's trading at a premium because the bond was issued at a time when interest rates were, uh, were higher and now rates are lower. So let's say you, the bond that was sold when interest rates were 5%. And now interest rates today on a 10-year bond are closer to four. So you're willing to pay above par uh, for that bond because you're getting 5% when a new issue would be four. So let's say you charge your 1% spread uh, and now you know you're, you own that bond. But the problem is a lot of bonds have call features. And if it's in the period where the company can call the bond, you won't get the next maybe five years to get that full interest. Maybe it's callable next month or next year. And now and, and call, callable means that the company realizes we don't need to be paying this high interest rate. We're going to repay this and we're going to reissue a new bond at a lower rate, correct? Exactly right. So your cost of you know, that you're paid a premium, you thought you would earn, say, on a higher rate for five more years, and maybe you only own it for one year. So instead of costing you 20 basis points a year, it costs you 1%. Or if they added two points to it, it would cost you, you know. So that's a second way that the broker dealers screw the investor. They tend to try to sell callable bonds, which then get called and guess what? Now they get a second chance to double dip because your bond got called and now they can screw you again by selling you another callable bond that might, you know, if rates are now lower than they were. Now today there aren't many callable bonds that are selling the premiums because mm. rates have, you know, obviously gone up. But, you know, the, the next cycle when that happens, we'll see this. And then there's a whole other category uh, which we didn't discuss in the book because they weren't that popular yet in the U.S. when I wrote the book, something called structured notes. And before we get to structured notes, I want to go back and think about, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you think about capitalism, <clears throat> what we want generally is less government regulation and more price competition. The more price competition we have, you know, the whether it's the iPhone or your car or whatever, the companies are really fighting it out with each other to try to bring more value at lower prices. And it works very well. And so why doesn't it work in the broker dealer world? Because I can understand from a judge's perspective to say, sorry, this is a free market. And if, you know, if they can charge that price and the investors are willing to buy it and there's no fraud, right? If, if they send you a bill and say, you know, uh, we charge you 1% when in fact they charge 5%, okay, then you could say that there was a misrepresentation or fraud. But if there was no fraud, why isn't this correcting? Yeah, because uh, the one, the law is written that they're allowed to charge reasonable fees. What shocks me is if a firm were taking you know, buying some illiquid security from you and they can't sell it and they don't know where the price is, there's no liquid market for it. Okay, you could charge a big spread 
a big fee because you now have the risk and maybe you can't even resell it. You might have to hold the bond for months or mm. even longer, and you don't know where the market will be at that time. So maybe a five or a six percent fee might be applicable. But when you're just basically an order taker and you're taking no risk, you're entitled to a fee for giving advice and mm. suggesting maybe to buy the bond. So maybe a one percent fee or something like that or less might be appropriate. And really, I cannot understand how judges, except they may be owned by the brokerage community, who's you know they're getting contributions. Oh, that wouldn't happen in America. Only yeah, third world countries. Yeah, well, they they wouldn't be owned in that sense, but the brokerage firm could be supporting their political campaigns. They have a, a much lot more of cheeky way of doing it. Elected in the U.S., they're not appointed, right? So that could be a problem. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about structured. Uh, before notes. before we go there, I just want to highlight that um, in 2018, CFA Institute came out with a statement of investor rights, and you made me think about it. Um, and I just was wanted to highlight a couple of those rights. Um, one of them is number three is my financial interests take precedence over those of the professional and the organization. This is your right when you go. And the other one is this one, which I like. Um, uh, hold on. All and this is number eight. All explanation of uh, an explanation of all fees and costs charged to me, and information showing these expenses to be fair and reasonable. In other words, I have a right to a, an explanation. And as I tell people when I have taught and 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 taught about these and, and given some speeches about these, what I try to tell people is that it's not your responsibility to figure it out. If your financial advisor is give, telling you something that's confusing, what you need to do is go back and ask them, please explain that in a more clear way. You have that right. And I just wanted to highlight that. And if they can't do that, you got to get out of there. Yep, yeah, exactly. It's not only their right, in my view, it's their obligation. Correct. Right? Trust but verify is always the, the basic principle. So let's move on to talk briefly about structured notes, which are sold in now in the tens of billions. They actually are much bigger percentage of the market in Europe, for example. Uh, and so a structured note is what we would call a derivative instrument. It has an, it's a creditor. If let's say UBS, a uh, big bank, decides to issue debt and the debt is tied to something like, we'll return to you the return on the S&P 500, but it's on the index of price appreciation. So one way they screw you is, not the total return, will give you the price appreciation, which doesn't count the dividends. <laughs> People forget that. And so they lose today roughly 2% and not counting that. Uh, and then they might say something like, we'll guarantee that the losses can't are capped at 10% or 5%, and the gains then in return are capped at 15% or 20%. OK, now that may sound attractive. My downside risk is protected and but I'm giving up upside. But most people uh, put much more weight on reducing the downside because they tend to be risk averse. And that's where the big institutions take advantage of that fear and the lack of knowledge of the investor on how to price these risks. So what the bank is basically done is sold you a debt instrument. Now that debt instrument has credit risk. Mm. So they should be paying more than the treasury in the US. We would use the US Treasury rate. And let's say UBS for a you know one year note might pay a hundred basis points over treasuries. That's not showing up in the numbers, right? Mm. It's here's the note. We're going to return pay you this return on the S&P, and there's nothing in there that says it's 1% more because our credit rating doesn't warrant the same as U.S. So that's the second thing that tends to, to happen there. The third thing is all they have done, they're not going to take the risk 
that let's say they cap the gains uh, at 20%, you know, they are, they know that, you know, they have in effect, you have sold them a call. They have the right to call it away from you if the S&P goes up more than 20%. They know what the cost of that call is. What are the odds you think your average investor in Thailand knows what that call is worth? Almost zero. Yeah, I, I would say it's virtually zero. And you have bought from, you know, and you've also sold them a put because you've guaranteed them they can't lose more than X. What are the odds that your client or a friend or an investor in Thailand knows what the cost of that put is? Again, it's probably close to zero. So what, what do we know is this. The research has done, there have been several papers that have analyzed these hundreds of securities. And, and take a guess, Andrew, how far overpriced these securities are on average. Is it 1%, 2%? What do you think it might be? I would say typically one year instruments, by the way. I would say three to five percentage points. Mm -hmm. All right. You're a fairly sophisticated, knowledgeable mm. investor. For the, you're too low. Yeah. The average number is higher. It's six or seven. Uh, and now, how do you know that you should never buy these things? And literally, Almost never. I've analyzed when these first come out in the U.S. I analyzed like a hundred of them. Mm. And one of the first things before I did any analysis of them would be number one is I'd ask the firm that was the issuer, say it was Morgan Stanley. I said, "How much does the the broker who's trying to offer me? How much do you or your grandmother or mother or own of that security?" What do you think the answer is? All zero. Zero, right? And you should never invest. Oh, my in firm doesn't, uh, blah, 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 doesn't allow me, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. No, right. the firm allows them always to buy their own products, mm. right? So, you know, one of the rules of investing is you should always ask an advisor, do you put your money where your mouth is? I want to see your financial statement. Right. And you may have a different asset allocation because you have different risk appetite, but you should own the same types of investments mm. that you want me to own. Yeah. And if you don't, why should I trust you? So I have never once heard anyone tell me that they or their mother own them. And number two, I asked them how many institutional investors own the product, institutions who could do the math because they can calculate, they'll call up somebody yep. and ask them what the put in the call is worth. They can look at, you know, JP Morgan's credit spread and figure that out and then add it up and say, all right, here's, I could replicate this myself at this cost. I could go buy treasury bonds instead of JP Morgan or JP Morgan's debt and then add a put in a call on and see what it would happen. Take a guess how many institutions have ever bought any of these. I don't think they're designed for institutions, right? Of course not. They're designed to exploit naive investors, which is, in my mind, criminal. Hmm. I don't know how these people who market these things literally look themselves in the mirror in the morning and are able to live with themselves. Now, I did see one product once from an insurance company who was trying to gain market share, and it did have some worthwhile attributes. That's because it was probably designed by the marketing department and not the finance department. So mm. it's not impossible that it could be a good product, but let me explain why the odds so greatly favor you're getting screwed, all right? And so, and why the research has shown that the average excess cost is in Europe anyway, it's been 6%. Mm. Here's the logic. All right, so Andrew, you're the chief financial officer of JP Morgan. Yep. And you have a choice. You can issue the debt of JP Morgan as a straight debt instrument with no bells and whistles. And you have the alternative of you can issue some buffered note that has these caps on it or you know whatever. Mm -hmm. 
which one are you going to issue? Um, I would say that. Uh, I, the one I, with the lower cost. Yeah, whichever I can get the lowest cost. And if yeah, I can use those buffers and other cost, things to you're reduce gonna the You're going to hedge the risks, right? There. And you know, so if you have the lowest cost by issuing a straight debt, that means the investor who is buying these structured notes gets what? A lower return. So therefore, it's pretty simple. The answer is easy. You should never buy a structured note. And on that note, I want to just highlight that I've seen this in Asia. I think it's it's just a flood of structured notes. And I have a some friends of mine that have invested in these things. And you know, when they invested it, they sounded really smart. You know, it was something linked to the S and P and to the Australian dollar relative to the U.S. dollar, and I mean. I even had one of my friends call me and tell me, I can't really even explain what right. this is, but I bought it because I just sounds great. And, and, and they, they always lose on these things yeah, and they can uh, lose it's big. It's not impossible that you could make money because strange things happen. But you have to remember the more complex it is, the harder it is to, for the investor to figure it out. And therefore they make it in complex intentionally. Yeah, and that's where the whole thing about the market is you don't want to be trading against the most sophisticated players. That's yeah, what that, you're doing. That's the thing. Investors, I've tried to teach, we've discussed this. Whenever you're transacting in the market, you have to ask who's the sucker at the poker table because it's always a zero-sum game before expenses. Forget commissions, bid offer spread, expense ratio. For somebody to win, meaning they're going to outperform, somebody has to be on the other side of the underpool. And since 90% of all the trading is done by the big institutions, the odds are pretty good. You're the sucker at the poker table. You're likely to be exploited and lose. And it's Warren Buffett or some big institution on the other side. Uh, you might win. You can get lucky. Right? People win by buying lottery tickets and going to the casinos in Macau. But, you know, the odds are not good. Well, and, and, and just to wrap this up and go back to a lot of the other topics that we've talked about, what you've also taught us is that um, institutions do not outperform in aggregate. And that means yeah. that if, if you're just, market. yeah, if yeah. you're just trading in the market, and you're an individual investor and you follow a systematic methodology and your trading costs are low and you want to own a portfolio of 20 stocks, let's just say for the next 30 or 40 years that you're building that, you know, you have certain advantages because of not being driven by, you know, quarterly results and things like that necessarily like an institution. So when you're just kind of trading your skill into the general market, you have some potential to either get a market return or maybe even a little bit higher. It's possible. Or a little bit lower. Or a little or a bit lower. lower. Or a lot lower. But the point that the point is, is that when you have the massive, most brilliant people lined up against you, you're going to lose. And so likely. If, likely. Yeah. The you, odds you, are against you. Yeah. You're, you're increasing your odds to, when you go one on one with the most sophisticated investors that are on average losing in the market, but they're designing a structured note guaranteed so they can win. In that case, your your odds are literally close to zero. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. You've taken your odds from 50-50 to, yeah. you know, 595, which is- Yeah, that's, yeah. Let's I'd talk about mistake about number 17, which is, do you confuse information with knowledge? I think some people may listening may think, I, I didn't even really think about the difference between information and knowledge. So tell us more about this one. Yeah, so information is a fact, could be an opinion, uh, whatever. Knowledge is information that can be used to generate alpha or outperformance, getting an advantage. So we talked about in one of our early episodes, sports betting. Right. If let's say the New York Jets who just acquired one of the great quarterbacks of all time, a guy named Aaron Rodgers, and they're going to play their first game. If you are the only person who knows that Aaron Rodgers just broke his ankle and is not going to be able to play, you could 
pick up the phone, call a bookie, and bet uh, against the Jets, and the odds are pretty good you're going to win that bet. Now, the bookie might, if he found out you knew, that might send the hitman to take you out. But other than that, uh, you know, that's an advantage. So that's inside information. Mm -hmm. But the example I'd like to use is this. I've accounted this, you know, thousands of times over the 25 years I've been advising uh, investors. Actually, it's almost 30 now. So, Andrew, have you ever bought an individual stock because you thought it would outperform? At some point in your life, you did that stupid thing. and <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. So give me the example. If we'll just use you as, as well, an example. Well, I can tell you one of my first investments in Thailand was buying a particular bank that was really bombed out. I was a bank analyst and I thought I was pretty smart. And that bank really, you know, went down quite a bit after I bought it. <laughs> I had the same experience in the U.S. and we can talk about that later. But so let's use a simpler example. Let's say today uh, you've decided you're going to buy Apple computer. And so when people ask me about that, I say, OK, tell me why you think Apple is going to outperform because you're taking a lot of idiosyncratic risk. Mm. And I discuss with them the evidence that we have discussed before uh, that has showed that the average stock significantly underperforms the market, right? Because some stocks get 10,000% returns and the most you could lose is 1,000. So the median stock return is well below the mean. In fact, only 4% of all stocks account for 100% of the excess return of That's the equity. That's an incredible number. Yeah, it's an amazing... So... What the answer to that is, as we discussed, the more stocks you own, the odds favor you as you get closer and closer from the median, you move towards the mean. And if you own the market, you're guaranteed to get the mean return, mm. get less, very low expenses and low taxes. So owning individual stocks, unless you have a significant advantage like inside information, which is illegal to trade on as Martha Stewart paid the price and found out, right? Uh, you know, you shouldn't be buying an individual stock. So we, I show them that evidence. You can get rich, but the odds greatly favor you're going to underperform. So tell me why, given that evidence, you think you should buy Apple. So they'll tell me, Larry, you know, it's great new products. You know, this, uh, you know, the cloud computing and AI, and they give you 15 good reasons, great management, the team is fabulous, their balance sheet is strong, they got a higher credit rating than the US government now, sitting on huge amounts of cash, and on and on and on. And I say, okay, let's assume for the moment I completely agree with your analysis, and everything you said is true which may not be the case, but let's assume it's true. My, I then ask them the very simple question. Let's say it's Apple and let's just make it up. It's trading at $100. And I ask them, so why are you buying it? You think it's worth 200, right? Yeah, it's gonna go to 200. So I said, okay, so we got all these facts. My simple question to you, are you the only one who knows these facts? And of course, the answer is no. I said, do you think the smart guys at JP Morgan and you know every other investment firm and Warren Buffett and all these sophisticated hedge funds like Renaissance Technology, they are completely unaware of these issues. And if they <laughs> thought Apple was worth 200, would it be trading at 100 and they're sitting there on their hands and not buying the stock? If they thought it would be worth 200, that's where it would be. Why is it trading at only 100? Mm. That's because in their collective wisdom, the market thinks it's worth only 100, right? right? So in the book, we just talk about this. So the story I use is your broker calls you up and said, we have this brilliant analyst and here's what he's discovered about Amazon or Apple in this case. Uh, and here's the reasons why we think it's worth 200. 
But what they never say is what should be said is the rest of the market in their collective wisdom thinks it's only worth 100. But our guy, he's so much smarter than the market. He knows it's worth 200. We need to buy it. He's mm -hmm. smarter than the Warren Buffetts, the JP Morgan. If that person said that, you would hang up. That's why they never say that. So you have to ask the question. Give me the reasons why you are buying a stock. Mm. And then say, are you the only one who knows it? Or do you think you're so much smarter than the really sophisticated guys with their PhDs who spend 100% of their time analyzing these companies where you're maybe in your part time at 10 to 11 at night on your computer and looking at reading some analyst report, digging at the K1, which you're never going to read through their, you know, their disclosure documents because it's mm. a thousand pages and stuff and finding the accounting treatment of, you know, accruals and, and stuff like that to discover something that maybe others have missed. And, you know, now with AI, you got all these powerful firms having computers dredge the data. Unless you have some advantage, which you almost certainly don't, that's what you have to admit. And if you don't have an advantage, you shouldn't buy the stock because the odds are great. You're now going to underperform for all the reasons we discussed. That's so the problem. There's so many paradoxes, circular references, uh, tautologies, or whatever it would be, because you know we go back to this situation that if the market had no analysts, then the market would become super inefficient. If the market had all analysts, the market would be at peak efficiency. And somehow the market needs to be somewhere in there, in the middle of that. And, and I want to break down this uh, mistake into two parts, right? The first part is new information comes out and you think you're going to have some sort of advantage by trading on that information. This is just speed of dissemination of information. And now, you know, the pipes that the best traders have into the markets are in m milliseconds. There's just yeah, let me add one other really important thing. So there, and this I wrote in my book 25 years ago, okay? Not recently. This is research is that, is that old. So a stock comes out and let's say the earnings forecast is for 60 cents a share and they come out at 50 cents a share. So you react and you want to sell. It's too late. The first mm -hmm. trade incorporates almost all of the trading to get it to the right price. Instantly, on mm. the very first trade, the market has reacted and that's the right price. That's virtually the facts and on average, of course. Mm. Doesn't mean it can't drift lower or whatever or come bounce back when new information. But on average, the first trade incorporates all that information for the reasons we've already discussed. Yeah. These smart, sophisticated institutions have anticipated, all right, if the news comes out and it's here or there, here's where we think it's worth. So the second one that I just wanted to touch on before we wrap up is the idea of the mosaic theory. And the mosaic theory is a theory that is used to justify the job of an analyst like myself uh, to tell people that the purpose of an analyst is to put together a lot of different pieces of a puzzle in a way that other people can't see in a way that other people won't accept yet and therefore it's not in the market so for instance uh you know i've done a lot of work on tesla let's say i'm an analyst looking at tesla and i see something that i you know, maybe I've been to China and I've looked at their facility and I've looked at what they're going to do. And maybe I've done a lot of work, research, trying to pull together these pieces of a puzzle. And <clears throat> maybe the market, you know, at the, the Biden administration doesn't invite Tesla or Elon Musk to the electric vehicle launch. And you think, 
okay, something's, you know, I, I got to put all the pieces together. And my conclusion is with all those pieces together, that this stock is worth something very different from what the market is got in that stock, whether it's higher or lower, let's forget about that, but something different from the market. Now, of course, some of those analysts that come up with those mosaic theories and individuals are going to be terribly wrong. And some are going to be terribly right. And some are going to be in the middle. But my question is, is that, you know, that is what many investors think that they're doing is creating a story. They're listening to Warren Buffett and they're listening to podcasts They're listening to all these different things to create a story around a stock and then own it because of that. What do you think about this, um, this effort? Stop it. <laughs> and it's pretty simple because that's exactly what all of the analysts are doing. They're trying to put this mosaic together. And then they say, we are smarter or I am smarter mm -hmm. than the collective wisdom of the market. Now, that could be true, right? However, the evidence shows that there's no persistence of performance beyond the randomly expected, which means that, Andrew, you've been a great predictor in the past, so I'm going to bet on you, but then there's no evidence that you are likely to get it right the next time. Now, there are a few handful of people who have outperformed, but there's no way for you to identify them ahead of time because there are other people who outperform just like you, but then can, went on to underperform. I gave the example in one of our sessions of Peter Lynch, uh, generally considered the greatest mutual fund manager of all time. Peter Lynch was not the best manager in the 70s when he had spectacular performance. It was a fellow named David Baker who ran 44 Wall Street. Well, Lynch continued to have good returns in the 80s, though nowhere near as good as he had in the 70s. He still had a very good record. David Baker in the next decade turned $1 into 27 cents when the market skyrocketed. So we only know today that Peter Lynch continued to do well, but why would you have chosen the number two guy and not the number one guy? But here's a more logical even way if you're not convinced by the empirical evidence. What you're saying is there's somebody out there who can take all of this dis disparate knowledge and weave it into a story to figure out, in effect, how to allocate resources better. Mm. Can you think of an analogy to that about how economies are run? Well, what would happen is that people would start copying that person. Well, uh, um, the way I'm thinking the analogy is you have two types of economies, centrally controlled, mm -hmm. like Russia, North Korea, et cetera, and then Cuba, <laughs> Venezuela, <laughs> all right? And you're starting to get the message and you have capitalist society where the market is free to set prices and allocate resources based upon the signals it is given. Right. You know that prices are rising in an area. So you have a signal is a shortage. So we should invest. Mm. If you set the prices and s set the investments, then you're not getting market signals. And that's how Russia eventually went bankrupted. I think you meant but, USSR. Yeah. The USSR went bank and disappeared. Mm. That's why North Korea is a disaster. And all centralized economies in the world have eventually blown up. And my view is China is now on the precipice of really turning in that direction, unless they move to a capitalist side. So I'll give you just briefly, so how did China succeed, right? So centralized economies are really good at harnessing resources to make something happen. So you come out of World War II and Russia is centralizing their economy and building steel plants and highways and airports and all the infrastructure. And they can harness the resources because they tell people, if you don't go there, you're going to the gulag, right? And so they can get that done. But once those things are in place, now you don't have the market signals 
So they end up producing, you know, millions of pairs of size 30 waist pants when they need more 32s and 4s and 6s because there are no signals, right? China is now at the stage where they're going to lose all of the gains from their, you know, very young population. You get massive productivity gains like Russia did when you move people off of farms to cities into manufacturing and you don't have these small plots of land, you get big farms and more productive, right? And they've built all these roads and highways and now they've got a big problem because the Chinese government is trying to decide where to put their, this is why I think it's an absolute disaster with the Biden administration is now playing that same game and deciding what industry should be winners just like Obama did, and we gave money to some solar panel company and lost hundreds of millions. Of oh, dollars. Americans so want awful. this. Americans want it. They want the yeah. government to do it. Yeah. They, I Governments mean, they've lost awful. the capitalism. Yeah. Awful. There's no centralized economy in the history of the world has been able to execute once they get to that second stage. And I'm afraid that we are moving in that direction on this fears of protectionism and so we're going backwards yep. and that includes both parties democrats yep. and, and republicans have, having made you know at least 20 trips to china from thailand uh you know one of the lessons i learned was it was capitalist thinking that got china to, to combine with uh the industrialization and yep. you can say it was centralized. And globalization yep. favored them. Yep. So there's a lot of factors that came together. But when I saw the level of capitalism and the level of speed and the level of competition that was going on, it's incredible. It was incredible. What's happening now is, you know, there's there's a lot of other elements to that. But all I could think is America is moving away from capitalism and China is moving towards capitalism. No, China is now in trouble. Let's talk about this very briefly. Mm. So um, uh, the big Chinese reforms came, I think, in 79 or 80, right around there, after Mao was re replaced. Mm. Uh, and it took a couple of years to get those reforms going. And then Chinese growth soared. From eighty to uh, you know the early you know mid till about twenty ten, mm. so thirty odd years, Chinese growth in GDP was roughly ten percent, yeah, a little bit below that. But that's unbelievable. That's after inflation. So that's real growth. Yeah, it's yeah. real growth. So that was enabled by all these things we talked about: the very youthful population. You don't have to support a lot of old people. Right, you know, the social issues there. You had the shift from the farms to big cities, which enhances productivity at building all these roads and factories, which enhances productivity. Right, you can you don't have to take 30 hours to get from here to there, you can now go on some super highway and fast trains, and all that stuff. But look what's happened since 2010. We've had a very sharply declining rate of real growth, and now it's maybe 5% or so, and a lot of people think that's exaggerated and not real and likely going down. And now they're facing all the problems of an aging population. You, you know, the productivity increases are gone because you don't have the movement from farms to city anymore, and you now have deglobalization working against China uh, as well. So my own view is I wouldn't bet on Chinese growth, you know, helping the world economy, uh, the engine, uh, as it has for the last, you know, 30 years before that. And one of the things I would say, having lived in Asia, is that um, when I <clears throat> when I came to Thailand, it was 1992, we were in the middle of a 10-year farms to factory you know, uh, movement right. that you've just described, which I call farms to factory and basic infrastructure. Yeah. And we had that 10 year boom. And then in 1997, the bot collapsed. We had yeah. in 1998, we had 11% negative GDP. And we went into a really brutal time for about five years until then things came back. And then same thing happened with Vietnam where they had a period of expansion and then boom, they couldn't produce at the same levels. 
And then China had the exact same thing. So they just lasted for 30 years almost because it yeah. was also yeah. pumped up by the entry into WTO in 2002. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's not uncommon to see the farms to factory and basic infrastructure give a huge push to an economy. And then at one point it just stops. Well, uh, the good news for the world is if India continues on the path using to a more capitalist economy, India has the exact opposite problem. They're still moving from farms to cities. They need to build all this infrastructure. They do have good education. Mm. People are very literate. They've got probably you know more engineers being graduated and doctors than probably than the U.S. is even you know has today. I would yep. guess. Uh, but uh, so I think India the, and they have an extremely young population, mm. so they don't face that problem. So I think there is a chance that India could replace China as an engine for growth if they get it right. And I, I wouldn't write off China as easily as what you've said, because for a couple of reasons, the infrastructure is amazing, number one. And so they have there are benefits that are lasting benefits from that. The second thing is that they've built, let's say, the infrastructure for the iPhone, as an example. You know, there's some real value in hubs. In Thailand, we have like a car production hub. And it means that really a lot of that expertise is right there that the car manufacturers can take advantage of. And so there is something to be said about that. Um, the yeah. other thing, the other thing is that the education levels are very good and improving. They're moving from rote to more original thinking. And I, I can see that because I attended one of you know the MIT of China and I got to talk with so many young people that were coming up. There's still a lot of rote, you know, memorization and stuff, but I, I saw a lot of innovation happening. And yeah, do you know the, what the, the other, the other thing, the other thing right. I would say is that um, it's not, it's, it's totally natural for an economy to move out of that phase and move into a consumption led phase, which is what wow. the American has been in and wages are rising. So prices of Chinese products are rising and global markets, it's going to be harder to sell in global markets, but they have a standard of living that now, you know, is pretty strong. And my feeling is that there's a lot of consumer demand even within China. So, you know, I would say that yeah, I don't see a collapse. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm just suggesting here's some things on the other side of the coin to, yeah. to think about. All those things you said are true. Uh, however, is China going to allow capital to be allocated with through market signals? Or are they going to force companies to, you're going to spend here and you're, well, we know the answer to that, at least now, is they are making decisions where they allocate capital. And then you get cronyism and bribes and all the rest of the stuff that eventually, you know, destroys countries, right? That's why you yep. no centralized economy in the world has ever lasted. None, yeah. ever. And so I, I don't think China is likely to break that mold. So yeah. that's a big problem. They Can they make that transition? And maybe if they democracy were to take hold, as some people hope, because you get economic freedom, then you want political freedom. Then I would agree with you. You'd have that ability. Well, yeah. only time will tell if that's likely to happen. That's the problem China faces, though. Yeah, and I would say I'm not. You know, I I can definitely see that central control has you know serious limits for sure. But I just want to I want to go back to the last thing that we talked about about the mosaic theory. And I just I have to prove you wrong here, Larry, <laughs> with all of your knowledge and all of your wisdom. I'm just going to like just knock that all out because I was recently at a bookstore and I bought this book and I found out I can read all of Buffett's newsletters and he saw all of these mosaics and he put them all together and he's the best investor of all time. And therefore, Larry, no, you can't outperform through your mosaics. He explains his mosaic theories on every yeah. single year. Right. So we actually discussed this in a prior uh, session, and I wrote a book called Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett, for the first 
oh, 50 years of his investment career far outperformed the, uh, the market. Mm. And how did he do that? He told investors exactly how in his newsletter or in the annual Berkshire you know, mm. letter to his shareholders. And he said, I buy cheap companies that are hot, profitable, have tend to have low financial and operating leverage. And again, I buy them cheap. And so guess what? Eventually, the world got smart enough and said, you know what? This guy must know something. Why don't we reverse engineer what he's done and is he this guy with skill where he can create that mosaic that enables him to identify which companies will outperform? Or did he just figure out what traits you need to have as a company to generate those high returns? If it's the former, then we can't replicate Warren Buffett's ability to create that mosaic, at least not yet. If it's the latter, I could buy an index of stocks that have these characteristics. Mm. So firms like Dimensional Fund Advisors, Avantis, BlackRock, others went and recreated, you know, used the data and the high-speed computers to find out and test. And they have created mutual funds that buy the same types of stocks and over the last 20 years or so, Warren Buffett has no alpha. And, but, Once we but, but Larry, for- Larry, 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 uh, in 2014, he outperformed the market. In 2010, he outperformed the market. Yeah. But look and- at his return of from 19, from around 2008 on. Mm. And you'll see he is not outperformed once you adjust for risk. And in so. fact, when I looked at this, part of the reason I bought this book of the shareholder newsletters is because I wanted to try to figure out what happened in 1976 and 1979. Because in 1976, he made a 129% return in his share yeah. price. He can never and do in, that again. Yeah, in 1979, he did 102%. Yeah. And those two years, I would argue, probably makes Warren Buffett, if those two high performance years early in his career, relatively. When he had a small amount of money to manage, relatively speaking. But but the compounding of the money that he made from those two periods, probably without those two periods, instead of having a 20% average annual return over the, you know, since inception, maybe he would have had, I don't know, 15 or 14 or 13 or. You look like yeah, you're looking well, for something. All you have to do is read my book, Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett. Bam. And it, it's it's all there. All right. Uh, you can also go to that website we talked about, uh, Portfolio Visualizer, and you could run Berkshire Hathaway, right? And you can see its returns. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. And we'll just run it against Vanguard's you know, S and P five hundred fund, and, and this we'll is portfolio it, optimization. Which section are you using? No, you use the back or... test portfolio. Okay, got it. And we'll run it from two thousand and eight on, just to use that period because that was the all right. And let's, uh, you know, I don't know what the answer is going to be. Yep. So Berkshire earned twelve point six, and Vanguard earned thirteen. Whoa, and oh. with. And with significantly lower volatility. And that what was the period? Uh, 08 through 2022. Oh, my goodness. So uh, 12. Joe, it's Jack, 6. Oh, sorry. This is 11 because VOO wasn't. It was this is 2011 yep. through July 2023. OK, uh, hold on. Let me let's run it using uh, the Vanguard. Uh, S&P mutual 500. fund which has yeah that's the etf um so we'll run it using the mutual fund that'll give us hopefully what's the ticker longer. of that that's a vfaix okay and vfiax and here it's even worse now we're getting 
Uh, this is from January of 08 to July 23. Berkshire earned 8.9 with an 18.2% standard deviation. Vanguard's S&P Admiral share earned 9.8 with a 16.2 standard deviation. So Berkshire is underperformed by 80 basis points or so and has volatility that was about 13% higher. Boom. And Larry drops the boom. I got to take my Berkshire Hathaway letter to shareholders 1965 to 2014 book and return it to the bookstore. <laughs> no, there's a lot of good stuff in there. You want to invest like Buffett and buy the types of stocks that he buys, but you don't need to pick individual stocks. You can hire firms like Dimensional Fund Advisors mm. and Advantis and their ETFs, uh, and they will get you the same types of stocks, but instead of owning, say, 20 or 30 stocks, it will own you know, depending upon the asset class in small value, it might own a thousand. So you have a much safer portfolio because you got rid of basically the idiosyncratic risks. Well, so here's the evidence. You have to ask if Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of all time, you know, he didn't get stupid in the last 18 years. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. that, that's a great point. He should have actually improved his performance in the last you know, a couple of decades as he learned and continue to learn. Yeah, but, uh, you know, and he hired lots of smart people to help him. And he's got Charlie Munger who taught him lots of stuff. But the world has gotten much more sophisticated and now the competition is much tougher, which is why Buffett can't outperform. It's not that he got dumb. It's the rest of the world caught up to him and figured out what he was telling people. So read my book, yep. Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And I think this is a great way to end up the mistake number 17, which is do, do you confuse information with knowledge? And this is a, a great way of ending. So Larry, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom on this. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll have the links to, to all of Larry's books and materials in the show notes. And this is your worst podcast host Andrew Stott saying, I'll see you on the upside.